Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is KSU Fan here on a Sunday, which means it's the KSO Sunday show minus Drew Galloway. I, w- I wasn't sure if I was allowed to share or I was going to share why he's not on here, but then he tweeted about it. Uh, and I mean, Taylor Bratt was involved, so it's, it probably wasn't going to stay under wraps for very long, but Drew got married today. So that is why he is uh, not here with us. Good reason to not be with us. And I was I was trying to decide if I wanted to bring this up. We talked about the Big 12 later on, but I'll do it right now. Uh, very funny that, you know, Drew wisely did it the day after K-State played and a bye, bye week is coming up, so there's nothing to worry about there. Unlike the KU football player whose mom decided to get married on a Friday, the day before they played TCU, and uh, there was the story that the Kansas City Star KU beat writer had that uh, he was up at like 2 a.m. Saturday morning to catch a 4.30 flight to Kansas City, got back to Kansas City at 9.30, and then played in their 2.30 game against TCU. Um, that's a, a wild move. I know people will get really, uh, really territorial about scheduling weddings during the fall when football is going on. But most of the time, that's people that are just sitting around and enjoying football, not the people that are actually playing in it. So I'm a, a little surprised by that. But, you know, to, to each their own, a good family man, just not about winning football games, I guess, in that family. Uh, we'll talk about KU and TCU later on, as well as the other games in the Big 12. But we start with K-State taking care of business against Oklahoma State. Wildcats win 42-20. to now four and one on the season, one and one in Big Twelve conference play, and all through the week I felt pretty good about K State's chances. And even through that game, I still kind of thought that they would win, but there were definitely doubts that they would do it as easily as they did after Avery Johnson threw that interception coming off the Oklahoma State score. Um, so, what what was your interpretation of this game heading into it, fan? And then how everything kind of unfolded in front of you. I, I, I've I also felt pretty good about K-State winning the game because I, I did think we were a better team. I thought being at home would help a lot. Um, I thought Oklahoma State, um, while having some really good players back from last year, you pointed out the fact that maybe that's kind of the peak of what they were. Um, I know that last year in, in the metrics, they finished like on average ranked in the 40s. Um, so – there was a little bit of, of luck involved, I think, in the record that they achieved. Um, I, but I thought it'd be a, a little uglier game, not as much offense for either team. And I think I said something like 27, 13 or something like that for K State to win that game. And I did not, I did not foresee K State scoring 42 points, although I didn't, I don't think I anticipated quite that many possessions either. The pace was pretty fast. And part of that was K-State had two and three play drives for scores, which is something we haven't seen much that I think will be fun to talk about is actually having an explosive offense um, for the first time really in a long time for K-State. So that was a factor. And then uh, Oklahoma State just um, offensively, after those first four or five drives, really sputtered and didn't do much. And once kind of K-State, you know, looked like maybe Oklahoma State figured out that they had Ollie Gordon again and that they could run the football. And then K-State kind of shut that down. And once K-State shut that down and then Oklahoma State, for whatever reason, decided they didn't want to run RPOs anymore, even though K-State really didn't stop them that well, in my opinion, um, then it was kind of K-State's game to to win. And then K-State took it and, and took advantage of it and, and won going away. Yeah, it, it was one of those where K-State basically showed off that if you – are able to take Oklahoma State out of the very specific way they want to run their offense, they're not going to be very good because Ollie Gordon is not what he was last year, and Alan Bowman is what he's been his entire career, and that's not a very good quarterback. And K-State early on gave Oklahoma State the opportunity to kind of stick with it and and do what they were doing, but then eventually K-State's offense came around, The defense was able to get stops and force some turnovers, and at that point it was the Alan Bowman show, and that's not a a good thing to say uh, if you're on the Oklahoma State side of things. K-State in the game ends up totaling 559 yards 
Um, I'm sure you have some details on where that 559 ranks for K State. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I still, I still, some of this from listening to Cole Mann back. Um, the the eight point six yards per play or whatever we ended up, and that includes all plays. Uh, eight point six, yeah. Um, that was the second best in the climate era, and I think I did not look. I didn't have a chance to go back and look before garbage time. I think that might be the most K State has ever had the the highest yards per play before garbage time because they finished the game at uh, before garbage time at 9.6 yards per play. So that's pretty impressive to average almost 10 yards per play when the game is still mattering in case they only reduce that yards per play once they started running the ball late in the game when they were just trying to run the clock out. So very impressive. Um, the, the total 559, I think it's only the third to fourth over 500 in the climate era. And, and a lot of that is, you know, based on K-State has not been a very f- high-paced team. I think that factors into your total yardage when you look at those kind of stats. But I think it's still important to look at a 500-plus a yard game as a, as a measuring stick because that's still hard to do no matter how fast you play. So really impressive on the offensive end. Um, it bumped K-State in, in a bunch of the offensive stats. You know, I, I, put, I posted on Twitter the uh, Big 12 – advanced stats chart that I usually put together. I don't have points per drive yet because I don't have that for the national rankings from Brian Freema, who puts those out on Mondays or Tuesdays usually, but uh, predicted points added, which is like EPA. You hear uh, Parker Fleming stats of war on Twitter, talk about EPA. K-State now leads the big 12 on offense in predicted points added per play, which is like this, formula for down and distance and your chance to score from every spot you have the ball in the field. And uh, it's kind of like more like war or wins above replacement in, in baseball, which is some of those stats are kind of arbitrary. They're kind of hard to like picture because it's not like a yards per play or points per play or points per drive, but I still think they're fun stats to look at And K-State now leads the league in that stat overall, which is pretty impressive. So Really, really, really nice offensive performance. And that even then it wasn't perfect. I mean, you still had a couple three and outs and you had the Avery Johnson interception. So some things that they can get better at, but very, very pleased with that offensive performance. And to, to start, and the biggest thing was it was also the best first half offense for K-State this season. Three points per drive in the first half. And that's even with a couple sputters and and not getting that big play toward the end of the half where they got the OPI. So that could have been even more. If I had to ask you, very first play of the game, what was the or the very first thing that you noticed about K State that stood out to you uh, on Saturday? What would it be? Well, I'm looking for something specific because I imagine I know what you'll say, and that's kind of where I'm trying to get you to. Well, the first drive, I noticed they went four wide receivers and didn't have an H back on the field for most of the game, and we were our past the run rate for a good portion of the game was like 60, 40. We were throwing the ball way more than we were running it, which was a shocker. And then um, I would say Dante Cephas wasn't on the field. <laughs> like he didn't play. So um, those are a few of the things I noticed. I don't know if I hit what you're looking at, but I, I'll, I'd like to comment on it because I think it's probably pretty interesting. Uh, well, that that's along the same lines. I was going to say that Ty Bowman was out there, and yes. the very first play of the game went to him. And played uh, wide receiver. Yeah, yeah, you can you can you can take this every, everywhere you want to go after this, but to me, that came across as a moment where Chris Kleiman and Connor Riley said, "Okay, we've had a bunch of penalties, we've had a bunch of mistakes. Even though he may not be our most talented guy, we need to put." more of our better football-minded players on the field. We need to put somebody out there that we know we can trust that isn't going to mess things up for us. And, you know, it, it, the irony of that is that later in the game, Ty Bowman ends up getting called for an offensive pass interference penalty that wipes away a big catch for Jace Brown. Um, but, you know, that's disputed, and I don't think we can really put that on on Ty Bowman. But he comes out there, and that's what it felt like to me is, Okay, we haven't been able to trust Dante Cephas because the other thing, too, the touchdown ends up getting brought back because of the illegal shift. 
And, you know, there could be some blame that, you know, should Avery have been able to wait a little bit more or whatever. But when I was down there, the first thing I noticed was Hadley Pans are giving it to Dante Cephas. It, he turned and looked over at Cephas and Jace Brown. And that was one of those indicators, again, that there's some disconnect going on right now, and he's struggling. So that's that was the first thing that, that came to me was I saw Ty Bowman go out there, and then he picks up yardage on the first player. I'm like, okay, here we go. Uh, and that, to me, came across as a coaching staff that said, we got to get more guys on the field that we can just straight up trust, and, and Ty Bowman has that. Yeah, I, I yeah, that's right along with what I said, I think. Um, yeah, because well, honestly, when I first saw – I was like, who is number eight? And then I, you know, remembered who it was looking at the roster real quick. And then I noticed, like I said, we truly had four wide receivers on the field, which is something I have charted the whole climate era. And almost always, even when we're in four wide, whether it be doubles or trips open, 95% of the time or more, it has been with an H back on the field. Um, and this year that has been Lofton, that has been Garrett Oakley, that has been even Will Swanson a little bit. And, you know, in the past, that was always a Ben Sennett deal and, and, and others. But to, to come out with four wide, true four wide formations and have it be four wide receivers and not have an H back on the field was something that surprised me. I think the first drive, four five times they lined up with four wide and not an H back on the field in one of those spots. And now a few of those, they did use Dylan Edwards some in that slot spot. I don't know if he was ever split out to the wide uh, on the line of scrimmage wide receiver spot. But um, he was in that mix as well when they went four wide when Bowman was in the game. So there was quite a bit different rotation with the receivers. Um, and I agree with you. I think it was this coaching staff saying, we're not going to make some of these same mistakes we made in Provo and and cost our team, even though we did, you know, get a call, put touchdown called back on the first drive on quarterback power, which ironically was the only – only two, one of two quarterback run calls in the entire game, um, and then a couple of scrambles Avery had. But uh, interesting philosophy to throw it that much, to not run the quarterback that much, but it worked out well. And some of that's opponent dictated um, by what we thought Oklahoma State would give us. And obviously, you know, the plan was a good one. Yeah, uh, the plan worked out pretty well offensively for K-State. Let's start on that offensive side and everything that went down there. And you mentioned how things played out with the pass game earlier and how limited the run was because through the course of that game, you would look and go, man, it just doesn't feel like the touches have been there for DJ Giddens. But every time he did have the ball, something really, really positive happened. And he ends up going for a massive day yesterday, 187 yards, a touchdown, 12 and a half a carry. And that ends up uh, putting him in a, a situation too where um, he rips off a 66 yard touchdown where that that was really good to see from the standpoint of there had been a lot of runs this year where it didn't seem like he had the ability to get away from guys and finish it off with a touchdown where it you know it, and it's asking a lot because he's obviously a phenomenal running back but the situation this offense had been in where you couldn't always trust that guys weren't going to make penalties that set you back that your young quarterback and a struggling receiver group is going to make the plays further down the field. It's good to just get those six points when you can get them. That was a positive sign to see yesterday from DJ Giddens, who now is uh, one of only four players in the country that's over 600 yards for the first five weeks of the football season. Yeah, it was impressive. I mean, I, he had four carries that, that totaled 151 yards, 17 yards, 31 yards, 37 yards, and 66 yards. And you mentioned – you know, he had a 31 and 37 yarder occurred before that 66 yarder. And both of those, he got caught from behind and kind of pushed out of bounds. And I thought that was going to happen on the 66 yarder, but he kept, you know, breaking away. And and for whatever reason, toward the last 20 yards, Oklahoma State guy seemed like he wanted to try to strip the ball instead of tackle him. Um, but DJ got in the end zone on that. But that's impressive to to get that many big plays. And then you have Avery Johnson with an 11 yard and 21 yard carry as well so you get four carries of 11 or more yards and five and four or six of 11 or more and six four of 21 or more uh, that's a big day with your running game when you can get those chunk plays and then you know the passing game you know against BYU 
before garbage time, we had no passes longer than nine yards against the Cougars. And, and this week we had, I think, uh, let me look real quick. We had eight go for 10 or more, and then five went for 19 or more against Oklahoma State. So, again, explosiveness has been something that uh, Kleiman and and both offense, the office coordinator staff, Wells and Riley, has talked about in press conferences all season, wanting to be more explosive. And we finally saw that happen against Oklahoma State. And I think that was a big key to winning that game. Yeah, it was massive, and it was good to see the run game do it. The passing game also did it yesterday. Avery Johnson ends up having a strong day, 19 of 31, 259 yards, easily the most of his career passing. Three touchdowns, the pick, uh, and then five carries for 60 yards and two touchdowns. Now, that doesn't include the the touchdown run that got ripped back on him. But I, to me, you know, everything else was starting to look a little more crisp, which is what people want in the passing game. What we kind of saw outside of, you know, he threw the one bad ball to to Giddens that ended up as an interception. And we talk about when his his bad throws, he tends to overcook the pass. It, mm-hmm. It's there's more velocity than there needs to be, which probably makes sense for a younger guy. But there were a lot of situations, at least in my eyes, on Saturday where we saw more of the Avery Johnson that played in the Pop Tarts Bowl against NC State, where he was smart with the football and he was throwing it away effectively. I the best kind of ideal of that would be that ball he threw to Dylan Edwards in the end zone on the first drive. It was one of those where there was nothing there and he just threw it in a spot where it wasn't going to be grounding and nobody was going to get to it. And that was kind of the indicator early on that he, he was seeing things well. And then obviously he executed a handful of other times throughout the game. Um, the, the deep pass to Jace Brown and really probably his best throw of the day was the one to Garrett Oakley who was pretty wide open, but he made a nice move rolling out and hit him. So what did you make of Avery Johnson yesterday? Yeah, I I really thought um, he started well, had the little kind of a little hiccup in the middle and then kind of culminating in a bad way in that interception on a one-play drive. Uh, But then it just turned around, and then he just started making plays the rest of the game, um, both with his feet when he needed to and then um, through the air. Um, some really nice throws. I think you you hit it well. Uh, made some good decisions on when to throw the ball away. Um, you know, there's probably being nitpicky, but there's probably still two or three more times where you look and he threw the ball away and he could have ran it for 10, 15, 20 yards on a scramble. But then we saw the dynamic scramble on the last touchdown that he had where, you know, he rolled around. You know, and really even on the first touchdown was a pretty impressive scramble to score in the corner of the end zone. So he had two of those scramble touchdowns um, on pass calls where he made stuff happen with his feet, um, made people miss, and then did things in space. And then still, uh, when he did, you know, have the one run, you know, did a good job of not taking a big hit. Um, So really impressive job. His best game as a cat, in my opinion. Um, and, And that's good to see. It's good to see a rebound after, you know, what he even admitted in the press conference last week was not a very good game for him. And and he let some things get to him that he, he even admitted he shouldn't have. And the maturity to see him re- rebound from that and then go perform and do it on the field against, you know, what everybody considered coming into the season, a Big 12 title contender team. Um, Avery Johnson was a big factor in blowing them out, not just beating them, but in blowing out Oklahoma State. Yeah, that uh, was he he did a lot of things just really well yesterday and uh it felt like everything was pretty much going the way that you would like except for obviously the the pick. What what do you make of the fact now that we've seen over the last two games three interceptions? Now the one yesterday uh to me is a little bit different than the ones against BYU, mm-hmm. but w- where does your long-term concern maybe sit on him throwing those turnovers like he's been doing? Yeah, I I would say not real high because I think the one the the one yesterday was was really just a miss um, a high miss because the receiver was wide open um, versus last week where he tried to force a couple balls first force one ball the second one was a force ball the the I guess the first one last week was kind of like yesterday's where he overthrew a screen guy a guy a screen pass so. Um, you know, to see him miss like that is 
not great, but you don't see him trying to make throws that aren't there, which, which, you know, I, I don't want to bring up the past, but you saw Will Howard make a lot of those throws last year and some of them didn't get picked off, but he made that mistake of trying to thread needles that weren't there. And Avery Johnson is not really trying to do that. Um, so, so I would rather, um, have a guy that's not trying to force those throws that aren't there yet. Um, maybe being at times too cautious, but I think he just wants to develop as a passer, and that's part of the process for him is learning <clears throat> when and what throws he can make. Um, and we also saw, you know, what I liked as well is we saw some design rollouts for him in the game, getting him on the move, because I do think he throws it well on the move, and I'd like to see even more of that even if it's not going to be a, a situation where he runs the ball. I like the the short token rollout plays for him to get him on the move, throwing the ball. I, Cause I think that's part of his game that fits him well. Yeah. To kind of illustrate, I, I guess the, the point on, on Will Howard where uh, last year, I mean, if you can go, you go through and look at some of the, the turnover worthy plays that like PFF would assess there, there are a handful of games where he, either didn't turn the ball over or did, but they assess more turnover worthy plays than his interception total was. Um, I mean, the prime example would be the Iowa state game. He's got three on there. He only threw one pick. The KU game has probably the most notable where KU mm -hmm. dropped what probably would have been a pick six that puts K state out of it. Um, for Avery Johnson, it's his picks have been true picks this year. There haven't been many others, but I'll ask you this. In some ways, is that a bad thing that there we haven't seen more of the hey the play isn't immediately recognizable that it's there that Avery Johnson should be taking at least a couple more of those shots where you're trying to make something happen and and let somebody go make a play. Yeah, that that's a good point. I think you know you, that fine line of confidence that your quarterback has to make throws <clears throat> that he is confident in based on his pre-snap reads and the coverage he sees and the abilities of the guys he's throwing the ball to. I mean, I think all those factor into those kind of plays that you see thrown up. I mean, you saw some of those throws in the second half, especially of the Alabama Georgia game where balls were just thrown up and receivers went and made crazy catches and made crazy plays. But he also saw the last play or essentially the last play of the game when, ball was intercepted, the ball was thrown up and the cornerback went and made a play. So, you know, there's, there's give and take with that. Um, you know, I think some of that is probably from the head coach. Um, and I, I think Kleiman definitely teaches his guys <clears throat> to not make those kind of throws. I think Will kind of was able to do that because he had success with it in 22. And then last year, that success wasn't always there. I think he had, I think he got away with that some in 22. And, and as a coach, you kind of live with that when your guy makes those plays and you're like, Oh, well, it worked out. And then when it doesn't work out, you, you really can't, it's like the toothpaste in the bottle or the mm -hmm. tube situation. You can't put it back in the tube. Once you let your guys make, try to make plays like that, you're not going to stop it. So I think right now, Avery's still in that mode where he hasn't been turned loose completely in that part of his game. And probably the biggest concern would sit with the fact that you're looking at a situation right now where the receivers aren't really commanding those situations where you can trust that they'll go do that or that they can make the plays where, hey, just just know I'll be there. They, they don't have that going for them right now. Uh, you already mentioned one thing that, that Cole Manbeck, Mr. He like K-State stats and info, uh, he put out in regards to the the – Three of the top nine quarterback ratings from ESPN in the climate era, Avery Johnson now has through what that'd be six starts at quarterback uh, that he's made. So Skylar Thompson has the top two against Bowling Green in 2019, and then against LSU in the Texas Bowl. Will Howard against TCU in 2023. Um, I haven't confirmed. I assume that's the regular season game based off of how he played there, and then Avery against Texas Tech last year. Avery against NC State, Adrian Martinez against Texas Tech, Will Howard against Houston, Skylar Thompson at KU in 2019, and then Avery yesterday against Oklahoma State. So those are the notes on him. One other thing that I wanted to bring up and mention in regards to 
how K-State is kind of set up right now and what's going on with the two individuals on offense that we've talked about already. And that would be the rushing leaders in the Big 12, DJ Giddens. We know that this is a loaded league when it comes to running backs. And you have all these different options of guys that could have been first team all Big 12 and at the end of the season and whatever else. DJ Giddens is currently 53 yards clear of the next closest player in Taj Brooks of Texas Tech. And then Micah Bernard, who's kind of been the player to, to come on the scene out of nowhere this year, uh, is joined this elite group of running backs in the league. And then some names that everybody knew, R.J. Harvey of UCF, Devin Neal at KU, Cam Scadaboo coming from the Pac-12 to the Big 12 at Arizona State. Corey Kiner was underrated last year, probably only because he played for Cincinnati. Ollie Gordon's struggling, but he's been force-fed the ball a thousand times, so he's number eight. Quali Conley from Arizona at number nine. And then K-State, the only team in the league to have two players in the top 10 of rushing because Avery Johnson after yesterday is now 10th at 321. That's only one yard behind Quali Conley, uh, who had some nice runs yesterday for Arizona and their win over Utah. So what do you make of that list and where K-State sits and, and kind of what it could mean for the offense moving forward? Yeah, I mean, that, that highlights – you know, what we've talked about a lot this year is how well this team runs the football, how well um, Wells and Rally have been at scheming the run game uh, to be successful. The, the other thing I'd note about that list is um, the top two in yards per carry are DJ Giddens at 7.28 and Avery Johnson at 7.3. So not only are they in the upper tier of um, – yards per game or yards for the season they're also leading that group of players in yards per carry so um, you have guys that are showing that explosiveness that we've talked about in fact you know and this includes sacks 38.6 percent of every johnson's runs have gained at least 10 yards this year so um, that's that's something that's pretty impressive and then for dylan edwards who we haven't even mentioned 28 percent of his carries have gained at least 10 yards so um, you have some explosiveness out of that trio of K-State runners, along with the the high production, along with the volume, that's hard to beat. And that's what, in my opinion, makes K-State the best running team in the Big 12. So other takeaways from yesterday with the receivers. Seems like things are going in a better direction for them. We saw some of the playmaking come out. Uh, you ended up with uh, three receivers with four catches or more in the game. Jaden Jackson had five. Jace Brown and Keegan Johnson had four. Uh, and all of those guys that I mentioned go for over 50 yards receiving. Brown has the touchdown. And then the tight ends stayed involved in the passing game as Oakley and Ancio had touchdown catches as well. But the receivers kind of broke the seal yesterday, it seems. Uh, what did you see from that group and how much of what happened against Oklahoma State to you seems like the real deal and sustainable moving forward as, you know, the next game will be against Colorado and everything that comes after that. Yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think some of that was um, K-State executing scheme very well because Oklahoma State runs so much man-to-man -man coverage. And it was good to see those receivers um, use man-beater routes and rub routes um, and cross the field routes to get open. Um, you know, Jace Brown – I think he had his guy beat. He benefited because the guy also fell down on the 55-yard touchdown. That always helps. Uh, but still, that volume I, – I, I, I'm glad, glad you brought that point up. You have those three guys all with four more catches. It's good to see that wide receiver room get some, some good publicity and make some production happen from that spot. And I, and I do think a lot of it was, was those guys being good in their route running against Oklahoma State defense that is very aggressive, likes to run a lot of man-to-man -man and <clears throat> winning those routes. Now, now the difference will be finding ways to win against different types of coverages you're going to see against the Colorado, against, you know, a team with Travis Hunter and all that stuff. We'll talk about more probably next week going into that game. But um, it was a nice sign for, for the wide receiver group to step up, and those three especially, because we've talked about, I think, you know, I think we'd all say Jace Brown and Keegan Johnson have been the best too. Um, it's nice to see a third guy and and Jaden Jackson, who I think has done a lot of good things in his short career here over the last two years. It's good to see him have a productive day as well. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, continuing the offensive focus, because there is a lot of that, and that uh, is probably where most people had concern. Well, defense concern is leaked in, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But most of the focus has been on not executing, making mistakes. So let's talk about Connor Riley's essentially report card from yesterday. There are a couple of areas where we can go into this, but and you can break it down however you want to. And if there's something that I want to bring up, I, I will. But how would you assess the whole of Connor Riley's offense yesterday from anywhere from how the, the players executed it? Because, again, that's a large part of this, too, where some of the issues that people are putting on Connor Riley – the players just have to be better and smarter. Like the penalty situation, a lot of the penalties that have been committed, I don't know what a coach can tell a guy at, at some point. Um, and then, you know, putting your players in a position to execute, I've been critical of that at times. Yesterday, to me, the biggest area where he really failed was that third and one, getting close to midfield. I think it was the, the 37 yard line, mm -hmm. K State 37. Why are you throwing there and not giving the ball to DJ Giddens? That seemed like a situation of getting lost a little bit and trying too hard to make something happen. Third and one should not be a difficult situation uh, when you're coaching the K-State offense right now. But outside of that, execution, game flow, all the other stuff, however you want to take this, you can on Connor Riley. Yeah. I, <clears throat> first, it's nice to see um, – a well designed opening game script. I don't know how much they script things. Um, I haven't really heard what that what they do in that department, but to go, you know, 80 yards and 14 plays and have a touchdown called back and still score on that first drive was impressive. Um, there was a little sputter after that, two four play drives that started well, started with the first down play at on first down on both those drives and then um went four and out with punts and then the interception. So you had a little bit of, you know, Oklahoma State adjusting to what K-State came in with. But, you know, it's such a chess match, a match as a coordinator. And sometimes it's the adjustments you make to the adjustments that that is the key to the game. And I thought that was where Connor Riley really won the day yesterday, um, adjusting to the adjustments Oklahoma State made after that first K-State drive. And then – getting those explosives. You have a two play 56 yard drive and uh, 56 yards, although that does not factor in the 15 yard penalty um, on the, that's just actually yards gains. And then a four play 69 yard drive. Um, and then you, you, you know, even before half, you had the, the right play call in the rub route that got Jace Brown open and got called back in my opinion. So dialed up some nice things. And then another, you know, the big chunk 66 yard run from DJ right after half. You know, and you open up that lead and you feel good about where you're at. And then, you know, a couple, another kind of adjust to the adjustment to start the second half. They, in case they went three plays and out twice. And I think that's where you're talking about that third and one. Although I do think there was something up with, with DJ wasn't in on that drive. Um, I don't know if he was gassed or tweaked something or what, but then he did come back later, later to the game. And that was my most frustrating moment is, you had those two three and outs and you had a third and short that you didn't convert. And Oklahoma state was just asking you to put them away. Yeah. Well, K state eventually did put them away with that six play 73 yard drive to end the third quarter um, to, to kind of put the game out of reach for sure at that point. But so I, I would say the back and forth that he had to go through in the game and making adjustments and, and finding ways to be successful, but you still don't like to see, the four and outs and the three and outs and, and hope K-State can can move away from having those too often. Probably uh, consider this a win for the offense yesterday. The defense actually committed more penalties than them. Yeah. Uh, only two on the offense, four for the defense yesterday. I, I think we continue to see that in moments that are really tough sometimes for offensive coordinators, when the field shrinks on you and you get closer to the end zone, Connor Riley continues to be good. And he's finding different ways to do it now that people are going to, people should know at this point, a tight end's getting the football when they get close to the end zone. It still didn't matter yesterday. We saw that on Will Ancio's touchdown. And Will Ancio, he and Avery Johnson both deserve a lot of credit for how they played that and the offensive line too, because they held their protection up long enough. But Avery Johnson was very patient on it. And Will Ancio still had to make a pretty impressive grab, and he did. 
So that was nice. Um, so the execution feels like it's there. They're finding ways to, to be different. It's just about, I think, kind of smoothing out some of these bumps that are still there for a guy that is very new to this uh, and having this role. But I think overall, um, it, it's probably fair to, at some point this season, put a game on Connor Riley or a certain moment, but it's not probably right to put it you know, a chunk of the season or the entire point of frustration on it. Like he's not the reason why they lost the BYU game. We know that's penalties. That's a player thing, especially the ones that were committed there. Um, so where, where's the full scope of the K state offense sit right now? Yeah, I was, I think that's something, you know, we're almost halfway, not quite. I, I, I think you got to give Riley and, and Wells a lot of credit for, building an offense um, that a is so successful running the football 200 yards in every game so far this season. And then even going back to last year, you, you finished the season uh, with Wells as the OC with a 200 yard rushing game. Um, that's impressive, especially with what I think we would say is maybe Avery Johnson as a passer, wasn't quite as dynamic, hasn't been quite as dynamic to begin the season as maybe we thought, or the hype at least brought him to, to be um, maybe, you know, even though I think he has played well the last several games, Keegan Johnson hasn't kind of arrived as that big time pass catcher as a receiver. Jace Brown is probably still the best on the roster, um, but really only those two have really stepped up consistently. Although, you know, we've talked about Jaden Jackson stepping up this game, but you've had two receivers. So maybe, uh, your receiving core hasn't been as good as you had hoped it would be. Um, you've had injuries to the tight end. You lost Lofton, who is probably your best guy. Garrett Oakley's been banged up. And now you're playing Will Swanson and Will Ancio, who probably wasn't expected to contribute as early this season. And then I think you throw in a new offensive line besides really Handley Panzer and maybe, you know, Carver Willis played quite a bit. Portier has been around, but hadn't played as much. So, you throw all those factors together and like, you know, I put together a chart of advanced stats for, for uh, the nation and, and predicted points added K state is number one in the big 12 um, in points per drive. they will be top four or five in the big 12. When that comes out this week, um, the rushing attack is the best in the big 12. And then we saw the passing numbers, even though you'd probably put them maybe 10th, 11th, 12th in the big 12 right now, that's been, that's been improving from 14th and, 13th in the Big 12 just a couple weeks ago. So I would give the offensive <clears throat> coordinator and the offensive staff an A at this point in the season because I think they have outperformed uh, what, if you just look at the individual parts as I broke them down, I think the offense as, as a whole has outperformed um, the what maybe we thought it could be based on what those parts are doing. You know, I think DJ Ed, Giddens has been everything we thought he would be, and even Dylan Edwards has been everything we thought he would be. And really, those might be the only two besides maybe Will Swanson um, yeah. and Braden, Braden Lofton, Braden, Braden yeah. Lofton that we really thought they would be. So I, I've got to say the offensive staff has done a great job. Yeah, things, things are looking good for them right now. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a lot of things where – you're looking for improvement and you're you're going to get there get there and then you're going to have a little bit of a setback so you got to kind of figure out okay we we've handled one thing now we got to fix this new problem and they've done that so far where the UT Martin game seemed like some things got fixed in that second half against Tulane Arizona obviously was their best offensive performance of the year until uh this most recent game and then that you know they had the 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 way down situation against BYU it feels like right now, though, to to me at least, that as long as this team isn't committing those game changing penalties that are turning touchdowns into field goals or not points at all, that it's going to be really tough for this group to be held down and and really screw things up to prevent winning at a, a good enough level in this league because you have the playmakers like. And this is a future K-State problem. This is not something people should worry about this year or next year or maybe even the year after that. But, and this is just an interesting question I thought of and I want to throw out to you. How concerned would would you be 
with the if things did not change and nothing looked different, that Connor Riley would be the OC without a quarterback like Avery Johnson. Because there is the element to where, and again, this this isn't fair to Connor Riley because you're coaching the team you have. He's got a very dynamic quarterback. But if he didn't have Avery Johnson, where where would your trust level be in him as an offensive coordinator? Say, say he was coaching with Will Howard at quarterback versus Avery Johnson. How would you feel about that? Um, I, with, with the running game, I would feel better, um, because it's so good that can cover up a lot of warts in your passing game as you figure those out. Um, that, that is a good question. I, th- I think the good thing for him is he does have every Johnson as the first year office coordinator. So he does have that dynamic, even though, you know, I, I said before, I don't think he has been quite as dynamic as a passer as maybe we, some people thought he might be. Um, but I think, you know, we saw a glimpse of what um, that could look like last game as opposed to what we saw in Provo. So uh, the real test will be what are we going to see in another, probably what will be another tough road environment when we go to Boulder in a couple of weeks. So um, I think that will answer a lot of more of these questions. Um, you know, that's the thing about football with only 12 games, your data points are limited mm-hmm. um, really to, to really break down. And as, as we saw last week, and then the, as we've saw in the last three games, your level of excitement and, and energy and positivity goes can go up and then way back down and then way back up again in a hurry. And um, hopefully we don't see that dip again that we saw last week. <laughs> Yeah, the the best indicator of that uh, is I I can tell people like the the views on the K State Oklahoma State preview show that Dy and I did as opposed to the one against BYU um, or the one against Arizona even like you can see there's a difference in one guy a shout out to him he even commented on there uh, apologies but I just uh, having a tough time wanting to watch anything after that loss last week and I get that like. I'm in mm-hmm. the same boat. Um, I mean, shout out to Scott Wildcat. I I have become a religious <laughs> listener of him, but I did not listen to a single thing he did last week because I just didn't care to think about that BYU game again in any way. And I, I had to talk about it all last week in different points. Um, and, and that it, the BYU game so weird to me. This has nothing to do with Oklahoma State or whatever. And I don't know if you felt this way, but the rational side of me, could really justify it and say, like, I see how it got away from them. I'm not overly concerned long term. I thought that they would beat the doors off Oklahoma State. And it was a different feeling because coming off the two lane game, you know, Arizona also had a bad performance. It's like, I have no idea what to expect in that game. But I felt pretty good about them handling Oklahoma State. I mean, I had them winning by three mm-hmm. scores. But I still didn't want to interact with any part of the K-State BYU fallout because I, I don't know if it's maybe because I thought other people wouldn't be as understanding and realize the true situation of it or whatever it was. Um, but I, I'm I'm with everybody that did not want to handle thinking or talking about K-State football in the last week because I was in the same boat and I thought I had rational thoughts about it. Yeah, no, I, that, that's very true. That's very true. Uh, and then you get even more data points this week. Arizona goes and beats Utah, so you feel way better about destroying Arizona. Tulane wins another game, so you think, yeah. you know, they might be one of the better G5 programs. Um, so those things help contribute to the positivity. Like K-State did what we were supposed to do, and then you look at our other wins and they look even better. And then even BYU winning, even though they let Baylor kind of come back, maybe they were just trying to keep Dave Aranda – not on the hot seat. I don't know, but BYU still looked impressive and, you know, backed up. That was definitely what most people would consider for that program, a trap game after the getting their big win over us. Are you going to go to Baylor and win? And they did. So um, that doesn't make me feel much better about getting destroyed in Provo, yeah. but you still feel like BYU is not going to be a pretender uh, this season. Yeah. All right. Final thing specifically from the game that we'll talk about the defense, because there were some ups, there were some downs. They forced the three turnovers. K-State wins the turnover battle again. Uh, That's a a big deal. But they gave up 490 yards. 
over 360 of that comes through the air to Alan Bowman. Again, a guy that not a great thrower of the football. So a lot of that ends up coming from his receivers, just making plays. Also, once again, we see Chris Kleiman have a team that the second anything that remotely resembles a trick play comes out, it's instantly 40 yards or more. Um, what did you make of the defense? And is there a growing long-term concern here? Because I think the offense, the long-term concern to a lot of people is probably shrinking. It has for me. Like I, The last three games, the way that they've played, I feel pretty good about them. Really, the last three and a half, because the end of that two-lane game, second half, they were really good. Um, but the defense, it feels like with every game that's going by, you're starting to get a little bit – well, I don't know. I shouldn't even say that because it's weird because – you know, the two lane game, it didn't feel great. They did really well against Arizona and they honestly did a good job against BYU until it got down to, you know, you're dealing with 35 yard fields in that game. But there have been things throughout all of those games where you go, man, this team is not playing well. Um, certain units are not performing to expectations. And then yesterday was not very good for the longest time. So what do you make of what's going on with Joe Klanderman's crew right now? Yeah, it's still um, – there's some things you feel good about. I think the run defense, even though, you know, Oklahoma State started running the ball well and Ollie Gordon, Gordon looked a little bit more like last year's Ollie Gordon for a little while. Um, the run defense seems to be very good. It's very solid. Um, we don't give up a lot of big runs. Um, but the pass defense is still a concern. Giving up big pass plays is still a concern. Um, Oklahoma State had four pass plays over 20 yards in the 77, highlighted by the 77 yard on the flea flicker that you don't like to see. Um, the start of the game was not good. K State gave up 217 yards on BY or Oklahoma State's first three drives. Uh, was pretty fortunate they missed a pretty easy field goal um, of I think what 34 yards, something like that. So um, you don't like to see that. And then they gave up a field goal. Fortunately, gave up only a field goal after the interception from it, from Avery Johnson. So um, that that start was a concern. But then, you know, I've always thought, and I do think that Klanderman's strength as a coordinator is is making adjustments, and we saw that again. And then, you know, I think Dy highlighted, you know, K State fumbled, finished the game with three three turnovers and three three and outs on. Um, the final drives for Oklahoma State before garbage time started. So the adjustments were good. We really limited the big plays after that beginning of the game. But um, at some point, we got to we got to see. You know, as you as you mentioned, not getting beat by. It seems like every time a team runs a trick play, it seems to work against us. You don't like to see that, and I, and I just get concerned about giving up those 20, 30 yard pass plays that seem to happen all too often. And early in the game, it was giving up three third and longs on the first three drives as well. You hate to see third and longs uh, given up by your defense. But, you know, like I said, they adjusted. They started making plays. But but I said, you know, during the game, I think I even tweeted out at somebody that asked a question about the offense. I said, I, th I think my concern with this team is much more on the defensive side than the yeah. offensive side um, still. But uh, – I do give the defense and Klanderman credit for stepping up and making plays in really the final three quarters or two quarters before garbage time. Yeah, they they've at least got they've gotten things figured out. I mean, you go and look at what they've done uh, throughout the season now. In the in the second half, they've given up. I mean, we can count it. They've given up three against UT Martin, seven against Tulane, uh, and then I guess against Arizona it was zero. And BYU, who knows that that one a little bit of a different deal there. Uh, well, and then I, the defense allowed it. only seven against Oklahoma State, and that was garbage time. Yeah, and, and non garbage time in the second half, K State's giving up 0.89 points per drive, and anything below one is elite. They're giving up 4.79 point or yards per snap in the second half, and only a 32 percent success rate, and that's in all five games. So. Much better in the second half. The first half, they're giving up 2.04 points per drive and 6.3 yards per play. So almost a yard and a half per play more in the first half in the, than the second half and almost a 7% uh, 
better success rate in the first half compared to the second half. So much better in the second half. And I, I, again, I do think that's a credit to Klanderman and making adjustments during the second quarter and into halftime. All right, let's get into the Big 12 scoreboard, talk about all the other games in the Big 12 from the weekend. The other 11 a.m. game, BYU jumped out to a big lead early, 21-0 in the first quarter, and then they let Baylor uh, have a couple cracks at the end of the game, down only one score, but ultimately the Cougars hung on for a 34-28 victory in Waco. Uh, Any thoughts from what BYU and Baylor had go down? Because... I think just if you're wanting to try and feel better about K-State's loss to BYU, which, again, it just shouldn't matter to people at this point, even though it's going to. Like, I'm in the same boat as everybody. That loss is always going to suck. But BYU playing a tight game after getting that big lead probably doesn't make you feel very good moving forward about their true contender status in this league. Yeah, I'd agree. I I still think offensively they're limited. I think Rhett's laugh can make great plays for both teams. He just didn't happen to make any for us when we played him yeah. because we, we kind of let him off the hook. Made it easier. I don't, yeah. I don't think they have I don't think they have a great running game. I think they have a couple decent I mean Chase Roberts is good. That's a good receiver and they have a couple other decent ones and they have a decent tight end. Um but I think they're going to be limited on what they can do offensively and I think they're a team if you get ahead of them, if it, someone comes out against them and gets a two-score lead, they're going to have a lot of trouble coming back. Uh, they're going to have a lot of trouble if, if you really turn them into a one-dimensional team because their best running at, runner is probably Retzlaff from the quarterback spot. Um, so so I, I do think that probably shows up at some point. I, I don't think they're legitimately uh, probably going to make it to Arlington, although you know their schedule – has some favorable uh, yeah. games coming up. So uh, really, their their toughest games are all at home for the most yes. part, except what, for uh, I think they play at Utah this year, which their fans were very negative about their chances uh, in Salt Lake City. Yeah, that's that's something I noticed before the season. They had, I think, for the what I considered before the season for the top five Big Twelve teams on their schedule. And, but they had them all at home. So yeah. um, we'll see if they can continue to win those games at home against teams that I, at the time were for the best five. I don't think I would put them all in that category now because one of them was KU, and they're definitely not one of the best five teams in the league. Yeah, you can you could look at this upcoming stretch now. Um, BYU has a bye this week, like a lot of teams in the Big 12. But then they will be home against Arizona. Also, a game coming up then that very much favors them, and not just because this team is struggling right now, because this falls into the Friday night road game territory for Oklahoma State. The Cowboys go uh, on Friday the 18th to Provo, and then road games at UCF by week at Utah is this uh, four-game stretch coming up that will probably honestly determine if BYU is actually going to play for a Big 12 title, if they if they go through that somehow unbeaten, um, then you can probably pencil them in for Arlington, which mm-hmm. is wild to say. Um, if they lose one game, then I would probably tell you, you, you probably don't have to worry about them being there because I feel close to okay about saying that they uh, would drop a game uh, in those final three to either KU or at Arizona State. Um, but it, it, they will be fascinating to follow because getting that win over K-State has really set up the rest of their season to where they're going to be in a position to probably be the favorite in a lot of these games, so you just have to avoid multiple upsets, and uh, you might be in a good spot. Baylor, I assume you just assume you're going to say they're they're cooked, no need to worry about them. Sawyer Robertson's better than uh, the Toledo guy, though. <laughs> he is. He is, and and they have been decent on defense um, at times, but I, there's just a lot of flaws with Baylor. Yeah, they, and you know, the, unfortunately for them, they've got touchdown losses in the last two games to teams that are slightly yeah. better than what people thought they would be. Yeah. Uh, the next game on the schedule, TCU takes down KU thirty-eight to twenty-seven. Uh, what if the, these games are always fun after K State has already played and secured a victory? to kind of just get to sit there and revel in. And uh, people got to do that yesterday with 
a lot of different things. Jalen Daniels, 36.5 QBR, 15 of 34 for 179 yards, a touchdown and a pick. Uh, Devin Neal was not the leading rusher for Kansas yesterday, although he was still good on only 14 carries. Daniel Highshaw outgained him. Um, but Josh Shuver was allowed to throw for a lot of yards, and he threw three touchdown passes, and TCU goes and gets the 38-27 to victory uh, as Lance Leipold does everything except take accountability for his own team and just blame the officials. So uh, what are your takeaways from TCU-KU after TCU flips the script from getting their doors blown off the week before against SMU? Yeah, T- TCU is has got a very – I think they've got one of the worst defenses in the Big 12, and and KU simply couldn't exploit that. Um, uh, and KU's defense really couldn't stop TCU's offense. So I think D- TCU's offense is solid. Um, I, I, we talked a little bit, I think, in the press box. Um, if, if I'm a KU fan, this season is extremely frustrating because you pretty much punted any real home field advantage when you would have had – Really great crowds if you just had your normal stadium because you're coming off your best season in a decade and you're probably selling that place out or coming close to it if you're just playing games in Lawrence. But now you're making all these people drive to Kansas City and you're kind of filling up a soccer stadium and then you're not even coming close to filling up an NFL stadium. It's just a mess. It's a mess for that program who – um, I think all the metrics are going to say are probably still ranked in like the thirties or forties, but they're one and four and um, they're how, how long can you sustain that? I mean, it's hard to keep going in the right direction when you, when you, when the wheels start to fall off, even if you're losing close games to decent teams. So <clears throat> um, TCU's decent, but they're to me a bottom five or six team in the big 12 and to lose that, game in what is considered a home game for you is just not a good look for KU. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to think about because I think in a lot of situations and why people kept thinking that, hey, KU is going to piece this thing together at some point here is because they have been in these games and the losses have been pretty much the same things that you think there's no way that can happen the next week. No way it can happen twice in a row. No way it can happen three times in a row. And it keeps happening. And then after the game, you don't get a lot of clear and concise answers from Lance Leipold, which at this point, you know, you would feel like if you've seen the same movie four times in a row, you'd start to pick up a little bit more of the plot. And Lance doesn't seem to have done that. And then he added a whole other layer onto it where, you know, it's, it's hey, the officials, they screwed us or whatever, however he wanted to take that. And I mean, he's he's a guy I, I respect it as a as a referee hater, as people know. Uh, he will ride them the entire game, but there comes a point where he probably needs to start taking a look in the mirror. That if he can't shift his focus away from them and back onto his team, then he is probably a large chunk of the problem here as to why his team also can't get their minds focused on what they need to to move forward, and it's always dwelling on what happened before that. That is what it comes across to as me, and I, I think that's that's a serious hang-up for him right now. He's been able to do great things for KU football, and he's I mean, he's he's a great coach, obviously. Like, we're gonna do fraud watch here to end it in just a second. But and he's gonna be on there, but he's not as low as people probably want him to be right now because anybody that did what he did to take KU from that level to where it hit their high as of now last year. You just can't throw him down in the Dave Aranda category where like he's got legitimate talent there, but he has some serious flaws and and to me, flaws that are far greater than any of the ones that Chris Kleiman has ever carried uh, at K-State. And, and Kleiman, I think, has gotten more comfortable over the last three years where he feels like now, hey, I belong here, like I've proven myself. He will give it to the officials and he will have that stuff get to him, but he does a really good job of flushing it. That's why... Yeah. You know, I, I point out some of the lunacy on the board after the BYU game where they're getting upset about Chris Kleiman's body language when BYU is just running all over the place. It's like, what do you want him to do in that moment? Like, he's not going to overreact to it and think that, yeah, this is my team. We, we just suck. Like, we're this bad. We're 0-12 material. 
no, he knows that's not the case. He's seen a lot of football. He knows that's not the case. He also knows that whatever reaction he gives there is not going to be helpful to his team in that moment or moving forward. Like, you just got to deal with it and take it. And uh, I think Lance Leipold is still trying to learn that lesson. And he better learn it quick because he's coaching at KU and and their fans have had to learn that le- lesson for a long, long time. Uh, next game, Colorado takes down UCF 48-21. to UCF is officially a bad football team. And Colorado, they've got the talent. Things might be cleaned up just a little bit more. Um, they're better than what was anticipated, but we'll see what they look like when they actually have to play a real team, which they'll get after the bye week when K-State goes to Boulder. Yeah, the two things surprised me. Um, number one, number one, I, I was not surprised by Colorado's offense because UCF has a garbage pass defense, and and it's just one of the worst pass defenses in the Big Twelve, and that was coming into the game. And Colorado exploited that. Colorado is not a team that can run the football very well, but they didn't need to because UCF is so bad, and they still were able to at a decent clip. Um, but I will say Colorado's defense holding down what I think was a pretty good UCF offense, or, or at least was on paper in the advanced metrics in, in, in most categories, and, and holding them down to, what, 21 points. Um, and that's with some garbage, kind of some late scores. So I would say the biggest surprise was Colorado's defense being a little bit better than probably what I anticipated them being and in, in making some plays to stop a pretty good UCF offense. So um, I'll give Colorado State a lot of cre- or Colorado a lot of credit there. I didn't I didn't think they had that quite in them. Uh, Iowa State beats Houston twenty to nothing. Houston sucks. We know that Iowa State's offense has done this though mm-hmm. in two games against not good teams. They did it against North Dakota and they did it against Houston, where there just wasn't a lot going on there. I, I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that their run game is just not very good. They they are hoping that they break off a big one, um, but that yep. they're not. Uh, great at sustaining the run. And then, you know, they, they've got two talented receivers, and Rocco Beck, I think, is pretty good. But they're overall, unless they're hitting, um, they're a pretty one dimensional team in terms of how they can actually beat you offensively. So that's how I see Iowa State. But that was a, a, a solid team that isn't going to beat themselves a lot, that went on the road and just took care of business against a terrible Houston team. Yeah, I mean, 3-0 game, what, midway through the third quarter, maybe late yeah. in the third quarter. Yeah, I texted Alec and I said, what the hell is Iowa State doing right now? Like, what? what is this? And he was like, they, he's like, they just, they can't score. Abu Sama, not very good. <laughs> and then, you know, Houston's offense is bad, worse in the league. But at that 3-0 point in the third quarter, they were driving and had it on Iowa State's side of the field and Willie Fritz punts it from the 40-yard line or whatever. That the game was over at that point to me. Like, yeah, you're just showing your team, you know, I don't trust your offense at all if you're going to punt it from the 40 yard line. So, um, yeah, and then Iowa State did what they needed to do to win the game, but 3 0 midway through the third against Houston is not very impressive. Yeah, the, yeah, that's not a, not a good showing there for uh, Iowa State, and they ended up, uh, being able to to pull things out. So uh, we'll see how you feel about Cincinnati, Texas Tech, because this is the one where all of a sudden it seems like T- Cincinnati is getting a lot of credit for being close in this game, but it seems like we've quickly forgotten that Texas Tech really hadn't played a good game against a good team yet. Um, but Texas Tech survives 44-41 to 41 in a very classic night game uh, at Jones AT&T Stadium. Yeah, Texas Tech is is got a had a very favorable schedule to start the season with Cincinnati and Arizona State as wins the last two weeks to start Big Twelve play. Uh, both at home, I, I believe I'm right on that, mm-hmm. and uh, not impressively. Although I will say I will give a little credit. I think Cincinnati and Arizona State are both better than what I thought because I would tab them in the bottom three in the league, and I, I have them above that at this point in the season, but Texas tech is just barely doing enough to win those games. Um, So, so I will, I will, you know, give a little bit of credit to Cincinnati that I think they are a little better than I thought, but um, I don't know if it says that any of those teams are, are any good. None of them are in the running are going to make a push for Arlington at all. 
Um, they're just happening to beat each other right now. Yeah, I, I think this is the the top of the Big 12 is starting to sort itself out pretty quickly. Um, and there's probably only a couple more weeks until we have to decide if like BYU is going to be in there for the long haul of this season. Um, if Colorado is actually going to be able to insert themselves into that top six, six-ish range, Texas Tech and Cincinnati are teams that I think are probably pretty much safely secured in the seven to 12 range right now in the big 12. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that they belong in that range, which in a 16 team conference, it's not fun to hear that you might be 12, but <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world yeah. anymore. You know, it's, a, that's essentially like being seventh in the old big 12 uh, yeah. with 10 teams late game. Uh, I found myself tiring out on the couch with like seven minutes to play in the third quarter and I could have gone to bed, but I was like, well, but if I, you know, I get back there and I'm staying awake, uh, even though I'm tired, I'd rather just do it on the couch. So I grabbed the pillow and I just set it up behind my head and I fell asleep. I do not remember how the game ended. And I woke up to see Arizona really was never threatened in their 23 to 10 win over Utah. This was another weird one because Arizona opened the week as 12 and a half point underdogs. Um, Cam Rising, once again, game time decision. Hey, he might play. <laughs> of course he wasn't going to play. I mean, that's Cam Rising we're talking about here. Um, he has replaced Jalen Daniels as the most paper mache built quarterback in the Big 12. And Arizona, I, they were one of my my best bets, of, certainly to cover this week when D1 and I did the show. But I did say, hey, there's a chance they could just win this sucker outright. And sure enough, they did. 23-10. to 10. Big win for Brent Brennan to get Arizona back on track, who now with this win kind of reinserts themselves in the conversation about being one of the top four teams in the Big 12. Yeah, this is where our, their game against us doesn't hurt them because it doesn't count as a Big 12 game in the standings. So uh, that's a factor for how they can play this season out. Um, I was impressed mostly, even without Cam Rising, for Arizona to hold Utah to 10 points at at Utah was because I was not impressed by that defense at all when we played them. Yeah. But, but to see them step up and play much better on the road to get that win uh, was pretty impressive. The offense did what, I mean, 23 points Utah, I would say had one of the better top two or three defenses in the big 12 in in Arizona did enough. Didn't, didn't, wasn't super explosive and then put up a ton of points, but did enough to win that game kind of comfortably in the end, 13 point win. Um, so I agree with you, you know, Cam Rising not playing. I thought Arizona was for sure going to make this a, a closer game, more like a three to seven point game than that 12 point line that came out early. But um, I think that's a pretty impressive win for Arizona and, and uh, pretty impressive, mostly from the Arizona defense. Yeah. Uh, before we get into fraud watch and then close things out, if I had to ask you right now, just your off the top of your head, the two teams through five weeks of the season that you think are in Arlington based off everything we've seen so far and what we kind of know about these teams, where are you going right now? Man, that it's, <laughs> it is so it's tough. Cause it's a toss up with probably what, five or six teams at the top. Um, I, I might I might go K State, Iowa State at this point, just based on what the teams have done. Although, you know, finishing the season at Iowa State may not behoove the cats very well, given that they already have that loss to BYU. So it may not be be K State, but I think those are probably the best two teams. If I had to if you had to ask me, I would say those two teams are the best two teams. They seem to be the two teams that are on the most steady footing right now. Um, I, I mean, I know that people are going to point out K-State's BYU thing, and that's true. Yes. Like, that was a m m just monstrous disaster. Um, but one of those, again, that it was so bad in the way it played out, you just go, I don't think that team does have another game like that in them. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like – and that's why I said I'd rather lose the way that K-State did than how Oklahoma State did. Because how Oklahoma State lost was 
the struggles that we saw in wins that they've had against not very good teams and, and kind of the things that we've seen as repeats for their struggles with this current roster with K-State, it was just like, we've never seen a game like that under Chris Kleiman. And that game started out with K-State in full control. And like you talked about, K-State was able to put Oklahoma State in a position where Alan Bowman had to become a true drop back passer. If K-State is able to just go up 14 nothing, like it looked like they were poised to do in that game at various points, then you're asking Jake Retzlaff to throw the ball for 75 yards every time to go down and get back into that game, and he will make a mistake if that happens. Uh, the only game that he's been clean in this year is against K-State because, you know, he only makes so many mistakes in two, three-play drives from the 35-yard line. Uh, so I, I think K-State and Iowa State is probably the answer uh, right now. I guess we'll see, but on Utah, like if rising gets back, I think they're different. But again, mm -hmm. you're going to start running out of time if he doesn't get back all that quickly, because I think seven and two probably gets you into uh, the big 12 title game and Utah, they do have a bye week and then a pretty favorable stretch coming up. Uh, but they end with two really tricky games, Iowa state at home and then at UCF. But even that UCF one is kind of falling out of style. So they're, Utah is now in a spot where they have one of the easier schedules left in the Big 12, and uh, you might be rooting for Colorado or somebody to knock them off uh, if you want to get there. All right, uh, let's get to Fraud Watch, wrap things up rather quickly here. I was going to put together a whole thing to try and add a little bit more imaging and build up the fun of Fraud Watch, uh, but then the initial thing that I wanted to do, I was like, that is uh, that's a federal violation. I can't use the EAS uh, sounds. Uh, so it's just going to be boring, normal fraud watch this week. But here is the week five fraud watch. There are some changes, new additions to the list. Uh, just for <laughs> reference real quick for everybody, here is how week three looks. So you see there are a lot of, a lot of flips and everything that's gone on. This started getting built out last week uh, and then continued in this week. So the week five fraud watch, Chris Kleiman, Mike Gundy, Kyle Whittingham, still studs despite the fact that all of those guys have now lost at least once in the last two weeks. Uh, but, you know, we know overall those guys are studs. If they get their problem solved, they'll figure it out. But that's why Mike Gundy and Kyle Whittingham also have spots in the <laughs> fraud watch category um, because they are also in a situation of Mike Gundy, if he doesn't get a real quarterback, and Kyle Whittingham, if he also doesn't get a real quarterback, are in the fraud watch Land. Now, Kyle Whittingham has one on his roster. He just has to tell him, dude, you, you're going to be tough enough to play this week? Let's let's get this sucker rolling. Uh, Mike Gundy, he has not recruited one since Spencer Sanders. Um, so, And that's been a while. So Gundy might have a real problem on his hands. All those fake demises that everybody tried saying, like, oh, this is Gundy's last year. We might actually be getting close to the end of that if he doesn't find a real quarterback soon. We'll see what Zane Flores looks like uh, by the time he actually sees the field, and who knows when that will be. Kalani Sataki trying to get himself in the stud category. He's a sleeping stud, I would say. I've always thought that. I think he's a good coach, but he's you know done some things to hold himself back. Right now, his team has uh, got some magic working, so he could be heading towards stud territory. Matt Campbell, he's trying to become a stud again. If he can get the clones to like 7-1, and 8-0, oh, we'll have that conversation. Scott Satterfield, I still don't care about you. I still don't think you're a very good coach. Not worried. By the way, I wanted to bring this up uh, real quick. Uh, what is the weirder impersonation of your idol? Is it Dylan Rayola with Patrick Mahomes or Eli Drinkwitz for his mentor, <laughs> Scott Satterfield? Because they both look like each other and they rock the dumb visors and everything else. So uh, which one's weirder in your book? The, the Rayola... Mahomes thing is odd to see every I mean I've not watched the game but you see the clips on Twitter and then the side by side with Mahomes and you're like dude come up with your own thing like I get it you can like a guy but I I think it's a little bit much yeah you know the the hairstyle and like the 15 and all that like I was like okay you know a little whatever but you can look past that because that's that's what everybody's doing yeah. now um that that is growing up and and going through the Mahomes era the pregame stuff, though, is where that's, it's like to me, like that's, that's over the top. That's where I'm out. And that's where I'm like, yeah, this is where, 
you know, it's it's if Dale and Rayola wasn't the talented quarterback, he would have been a kid that probably got bullied in school and then, like the parents were having to call home and it's like, hey, Dylan had another bad day. Kids were like, <laughs> you're not Patrick Mahomes, doofus. Um, so, yeah, that, that's – but I noticed that last time. I was like, oh, my gosh. These two App State guys, they look just <laughs> like each other. Yeah. It's very strange. Uh, I guess that's what the mountains do to, to a person. And then Willie Fritz. Willie, got to get it figured out, son, because this is not uh, not going well for you. Kenny Dillingham, bye week. Um I'm going to make him a stud for the entire season if he can beat KU next week. So he gets permanent stud status <laughs> for at least one season if he gets the job done against KU. In the watch category, uh, we already mentioned Mike Gunny and Kyle Whittingham. They just got to find real quarterbacks. If that doesn't happen, then they get that category. They get you know foot in both uh, spots. Lance Leipold, Gus Malzahn, they stay in the watch zone, although – both are teetering towards heading to that advisory category, which a very keen eye would notice that Deion Sanders, for the first time in fraud watch history, <laughs> has advanced out of warning territory. Look out. The Deion Sanders experiment is going close to how Colorado envisioned. The Buffaloes might have some real juice. Deion Sanders is joined by Neil Brown and Joey McGuire in the fraud advisory category. Uh, big day for the Sanders family. I know that when they got word earlier, uh, they they were celebrating. Uh, they were creating new rap songs for uh, Shadur. So congratulations to Dion for uh, the bump up there. Impressive list. I, I, I mean, I will say, you know, I, I completely understand your Joey McGuire rationale, though, you know, I'm sure – the tech fans with them being four and one and two and oh in the league would, would come after you a little bit, but um, that's the only one I thought, well, not my, myself personally, but the opposing fans, if they're going to come after you, it's probably the tech people. Yeah. Well, you know, what are you going to do? I did see, uh, I got to go find the tweet real quick though, because this, this ties into the uh, tech fans and everything else going on. Dan Wetzel of uh, Yahoo tweeted out Texas Tech beats Cincinnati and is 4 and 1 now really showing progress under Joey McGuire Red Raiders looking legit and I tweeted out have you watched anything other than the win column because that's really the only thing that would suggest that Joey McGuire and the Red Raiders are looking legit right now uh, is that they're 4 and 1 uh sometimes it matters how you end up getting yeah. to 4 and 1 so, uh, and then the final category, I know you've all been waiting for it. Dave Aranda still down there. Poor guy. This should concern him, but he's getting very close to number one, having the category named after him and then just being tossed in no man's land because that's how bad he is. It's just not even worth calling him a fraud anymore. Um, because he's just not very good at it. And then Sonny Dykes, um, congratulations. You beat what might be the dumbest team in the big 12 right now. So Good bounce back, but that loss to SMU, it's going to hang around for a long time. You got a lot of work to do, Sonny. Uh, I don't, well, actually, I think they have a really easy game. I think they play Houston this week. Mm. So he's not going to get to move up after that uh, and how everything else goes. But that is your fraud watch for this week. Uh, any, any concerns on it? Anybody that you want to please your case, they should be higher or lower? Um, the only one. I would, you know, I, I could, I could make a case maybe for. It would. It, it's probably too far to make the jump, but Dion could be in the watch category because he has been much more impressive than I anticipated. After that Nebraska loss, I thought they may fall apart, but, um, I mean, I know they've only beaten Baylor, and UCF, but the UCF win impressed me more, maybe more than it should at this point, but. I, I did not see that kind of defense coming from the Buffaloes. Yeah, they've they've, they've played really well. Uh, all right, there you go. That is Fraud Watch for week five. We'll see if I put a new one together next week or if I just want to wait until uh, K-State, Colorado. I'll probably put a new one together next week depending on uh, what we have going on and how the movement ends up working out. But that will do it for us today. Thanks to Fan for joining. Congratulations to Drew Galloway, a now married man. Uh, so that's why he was not here today. Using the bye week for uh, what you should. And like I said earlier, uh, waiting until after the team that you're involved with in some way 
has played their game and goes on their bye week, not like um, Ty Barry Hill's mom, the, the KU <laughs> linebacker, who he didn't get to Kansas City until 9 a.m. on Saturday, uh, four or five hours before they played a game because his mom got married. So congratulations to the Barry Hill family. Uh, you know, I hope the I hope I hope the marriage works out and uh, that it was worth your son costing his team a victory against a bad TCU team. That's on you, mom. So shout out to her. For KSU underscore fan, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching the KSO show. We will be back again on Monday. It'll be DY and I because we have no other option. Drew will be off celebrating, having the time of his life, I'm sure. And then uh, we'll have coverage all throughout this bye week. It'll be a little bit different, but uh, we'll do some fun things throughout. Oh, also, uh, real quick, I want to update everybody because I have been keeping track of it now. Uh, in our stock game that we did for Big 12 football teams, Drew kicking everybody's butt. He's got 22 points, mainly because K-State, Iowa State, and Arizona State are playing well. Um, and then, Fan, you and I are now tied in second uh, with 18 points. I had a big weekend because all three of my teams that played won. So, shout out to Arizona and Texas Tech and BYU. And then, poor D.Y. His team has fallen apart hard this year. He has Oklahoma State, KU, Colorado, and Houston. That is a combined nine wins through the first five weeks of the season. No top 25 wins. And only one of those teams secured an out-of-conference power for victory. Uh, things not going well for D.Y. squad. He has 12 points. So we'll continue to update that throughout the year and uh, do more with it as we continue on. D.Y. also wants us to do it for basketball. So that might be something we tackle at mm -hmm. some point. Uh, next weekend with uh, the bye week coming to a close. So for fan, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. We're always on over at On3. You can find us there.